Welcome to the beginning of Series 47, everyone. We are back from our two-week break to bring you a fantastic series that is very romance-oriented. Just in time for February, the month of love. That's right, we are covering a game that is sure to get your hearts racing, Thirsty Sword Lesbians. And we cannot wait for you to hear all of our nonsense turned all the way up. But before we get to all of that, First, some announcements. I liked the way that you said month of love, like you were like month a radio DJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's the month of love. <laughs> First up, uh, my episode of Kill Every Monster just came out last week. Uh, I got to dive into my favorite kind of nonsense and talk about the undead hordes um, and necromancy. Yeah. So I had, uh, it was, it was just the best time for those mm. of you not familiar with the podcast. Um, Aram and Dylan sit down with a guest every two weeks um, and talk about a monster from the D&D Monster Manual. They talk mm. about what it does, how to make it better. Um, and then we do a fun encounter where we try and kill Aram. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I had a great time. I had a great, I mean, like... It was peak um, discussion of the moral and ethical implications of necromancy. And so mm. I think it was like, it was a very Amelia moment. Yeah. Um, so you can find that episode at killeverymonster.com or anywhere that you find podcasts. Yeah, I've, I've been making my way uh, through that podcast lately. And it is, it, it has become probably my favorite podcast out there right wow, now which is saying and something for you because you are like you listen to a lot of podcasts i do listen to a lot of podcasts, but like the the presentation of this podcast just blows my mind and yeah. um yeah. i cannot say uh i can't say enough good things about it it's mm -hmm. just so good yeah the um, editing is phenomenal Aram puts in tons of work i have yeah. to say like as a guest on there it was such an awesome experience I've been friends with Dylan for a while, mm. um, and I know that like he and Aram had wanted to start a show for a long time, and so I'm so excited that they finally got the chance to like make their schedules match up to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I saw that the show started, and I messaged them and messaged Dylan and said, um, "Excuse me, let me on your show, please. <laughs> so yeah. Pick a monster." <laughs> and then I messaged him, and I was like, "There's skeletons in here." There's skeletons in the monster manual. And he's like, you can have zombies for free. <laughs> so, <laughs> Two for the price of one. It was great. Yeah. I had an awesome time, but it's a, it's absolutely. a great podcast. Like just a fun concept for a show too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, definitely check it out if you haven't yet, because it is phenomenal and check out Amelia's episode. Uh, I listened to the first bit of it, uh, skipped ahead in my listening queue a little, and it started off fantastic. And, um, Aram has uh, been been a source of inspiration in the last couple of weeks uh, for for myself uh, for what I want to do with editing and whatnot. But like the marketing for this podcast is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I figured out how to make our episodes shine a little bit more, uh, and and we're rolling out those uh, those updates that you'll probably have noticed on Twitter. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm excited. So excited. Well, next on the list of announcements is that we would appreciate your assistance. Uh, if you love what we're doing here, uh, love what you hear in this series, uh, and if you're here for the first time even, uh, or if you just want to send uh, some warm and fuzzy feelings to some cold Wisconsinites during these chilling months, uh, please head over to Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, Spotify, or others uh, to leave a rating and review. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Twitter at CreationCast or join our Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com and let us know what you think. We would love to hear from you, and for every five-star review we get, we will read it out in the call to action section at the end of our episodes. We absolutely love to have more to read, and goodness, we are out right now, so... It's been uh, sad. It's been a really sad time. So, like, maybe consider that your Valentine to us. You know, yeah. if you were thinking, oh, I would love to send something to my favorite podcasters, Amelia and Ryan. Um, <laughs> a little Apple a little review. podcast review Valentine would be great. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and then we'll read it out and we'll thank you personally. And then that'll be our Valentine to you. Exactly. It'll be good for everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Speaking of thinking, thanking you personally, um, I would love if you could help support my child specifically um, and order some Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm. I... I keep telling everybody, if you have a Girl Scout in your life right now, please find her and buy some cookies from her. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I know for me, like I went on Facebook and it was like all of my cousins and a bunch of my friends. And it's like, I'm, you know, like my boss sent out an email earlier today. Like I know that my child is not the only Girl Scout out there. So Mm -hmm. if somewhere in your family or your community or something like that, you have a Girl Scout that you want to support, please find her and support her. Cookie sales are how they raise the majority of their funds to do most of their activities through the year, which helps make sure that being a Girl Scout is decently affordable. I had to pay for her uniform this year because it's her first year. Um, Mm. And then like, I think it was like $40 for the whole year. Um, And that covers almost all of their activities and all that kind of stuff. And then the the cookie sales fund almost all of the rest of that. So Mm -hmm. it makes sure that it's something that a lot more kids can do. Mm -hmm. Um, if you do not have a Girl Scout in your life, you can borrow mine. Um, they get to these, (laughs) these kids and their technology. Back in my day, I had to go door to door and make phone calls. Uh, Uh Now they've got these websites. We will put a link to Eleanor's cookie website in the show notes. Obviously you are not obligated to buy cookies from my child, but I know that there was a period of time where I just really wanted some Thin Mints and I didn't know any children selling Thin Mints. So if you are in that boat, have I got a child for you? You can have some cookies (laughs) from her. You cannot have the child. (laughs) She's mine. (laughs) Depends on the day. But anyway, um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. So if you would like to support the Girl Scouts, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, we ordered a bunch uh, just this morning and uh, got some for... uh, my mother-in-law so uh yeah it's uh so it's a very good investment i would say i would say cookies are a great investment for like yes. m- me two months from now exactly <laughs> <laughs> like i wouldn't say that they're a great like long-term <laughs> thing exactly. but like short-term amazing mm-hmm. the three to six month period especially if you put them in the freezer fantastic that's what we do <laughs> And then we can just, you know, throughout the year and just pull them out. I think we've got one pack left from last year. So oh, I've forgotten uh, got, to buy them the last several years. Gonna, so I'm like really excited. I have to get to it. I have to get to it. Well, th- we have one final announcement before we, we, we get to the episode. <laughs> um, as mentioned in this episode, uh, there was a fan created bundle that was released with six new playbooks and three new settings. You can find that for download on Itch if you enjoyed what you heard this week and want even more. Uh, We'll put a link to our show notes for you to follow. That is all of the announcements. I promise we are going to start the series. We are thrilled to have April Kit Walsh with us. Um, Mm -hmm. Really excited for you to hear what we did. I said on Twitter, I think that this might be be peak usness for a yep. series. I think that this might be the most Amelia and Ryan we've ever been. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I are excited to welcome April Kit Walsh, designer of the game we are covering for this series, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, a Powered by the Apocalypse game about love, swords, and adventure. Yeah, welcome to Character Creation Cast. April, we are really excited to have you here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. I can't wait to see what characters you come up with. Absolutely. It's going to be so much fun. I know. <laughs> I've been, I have not had the chance to play this game yet. I think I had, I like, there were a couple times at conventions that I was, like, gonna, and then obviously, you know, uh, well, life. Um, but I'm, like, so excited to, like, 
like mess around with it at least. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, character creation is fun. It is definitely part of playing the game. So mm -hmm. uh, we will get you that part of the experience at least. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so April, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, uh, where we can find you online and any projects you're currently involved in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm April Walsh. My pronouns are she, her, or gay gem. I am Gay Spaceship Games, and you can find me at gayspaceship.com or at Gay Spaceship GMS on Twitter, because that's how many characters they will let you have in your Twitter username. <laughs> um, when I'm not doing games, I am a public interest attorney at a civil liberties organization, suing the government over your rights and so on. And I am, in terms of RPG projects, I am working on doing a... Um, prettier version of my first game, End of the Line, about a sentient spaceship and the crew of the sentient spaceship on the way to the scrapyard, yeah. um, which is a descended from the queen, a lightweight narrative storytelling game um, that winds up being secretly queer also. Yeah. Um, Thirsty Star Lesbians is not secret. That's a queer <laughs> <name>. <laughs> No. <laughs> Haha, <laughs> <laughs> fooled you. Right? <laughs> Well, occasionally people will show up and think it's going to be objectifying, but as soon as they get to the art, then, you know, they know that it is not for male gaziness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Should we go ahead and dive into this? Yeah. We let's do. will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? So, what is the core concept of Thirsty Sword Lesbians? So, Thirsty Sword Lesbians is a game of telling stories about queer action romance and found family. And the title really does sort of encapsulate what you're going to find in there. But the it's not entirely romance focused. It's really about that need for a connection. So the, the core concept is that you're going to explore both your personal growth and the way that you relate to the other characters in this lighthearted and celebratory setting where we're not telling a story about queer tragedy, we're telling a story that's empowering and celebratory. Mm -hmm. Which is super important because unfortunately, we don't get enough of those kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. What kind of setting are you playing in for this game? Is it like a realistic current setting? Is it sort of a fantasy setting? So the the idea is that you can play in any setting where swords cross and hearts race. So because the game and as you'll see, the character archetypes are centered around sort of human experiences and relationships, you can translate it to any setting. So it's not genreless because there is a very clear um, mm -hmm. set of genres that mm -hmm. you're exploring, but it's also not tied to a specific setting. We do provide settings, five of them in the core book, uh, dozens in the in the expansion book. Mm. Uh, but we also have a little worksheet for creating your own setting collaboratively mm -hmm. to make sure that you're going to be exploring the stuff that you're excited about exploring. And we're going to highlight that here on the podcast in a little bit. I'm super oh, excited I'm about so it. I'm so excited. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we love making settings. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yay. Absolutely. So uh, what tools do we need to play this game then? Yeah, uh, you need the character sheets, which are called playbooks. You need two six-sided dice. This is in the Powered by the Apocalypse family of games, where every time a player is rolling, you're going to be rolling two six-sided dice, adding them up, and then adding a number like a stat. So um, that's that's the core uh, tool that you need. And you can also grab the Roll20 module and play on Roll20. Both the core book and the expansion are available there. Mm, very nice. What kind of stories and themes was this game meant to explore? I know, obviously, like where people go with it in their home games is sort of on them. But like, what kind of things did you like hope people would get out of it? Yeah, so there are a lot of really moving stories about connection and Sometimes you're playing uh, a fun bantery character. Sometimes you're playing a completely awkward, oblivious lesbian or gay disaster. And that's all completely valid, too. Like, sometimes I'll, I'll describe the feel of the game as you remember that 
scene from The Princess Bride where Wesley and Nego are dueling on tops of the cliffs of insanity mm. and they're sort of being playful about it and being impressed by each other and then Inigo presses Wesley against the rocks and then they kiss. That's the kind of story, <laughs> that's the kind of moment that uh, we're going for. Um, so, so there's both that sort of campy fun story and then also like sort of meaningful moments of connection and character growth you'll see when you look at the the playbooks the archetypes they're each centered around an emotional conflict that the character is experiencing so the trickster for example really craves uh, closeness and connection, but is afraid of being vulnerable. Mm. And the playbooks are designed to evoke that feeling and tell an arc about a character who is facing that challenge just in their own uh, self or development or life. And you will get those moments in play and with enough sort of lightness around them mm -hmm. uh, to, to get both of those feelings, the queer action being celebrated and the found family moments. And uh, you can start to get it in character creation. I think we'll see it later Very on. Very nice. Very nice. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, so then, as characters, uh, what what do our characters uh, do exactly in this game? Like, uh, I know we're we're telling these awesome stories and a lot of action, but what else can we do uh, in this game? Yeah. Well, there are a whole bunch of campaign concepts that are presented in the core book. Uh, so, you might be representatives of uh, an interstellar federation of you know, queerness visiting the neighboring realm of heteronormia to represent your <laughs> your uh, you know culture at a political wedding and then it turns out spoiler for one of the adventures in the game that not everyone in heteronormia is as straight as they you know, act Gasp. in order to Gasp. avoid punishment what surprise <laughs> right i know spoiler I'm spoiler who was raised why, in a catholic family what? why why is there no <laughs> real world comparison yeah, exactly right? as i like look at my family and it's like i'm one of five kids and it's like two of us are queer like it's like uh, yeah. oh yeah it's fine it happens right? you know? <laughs> and you'll see when we do world building one of the steps is figuring out what is the scope of your positive and supportive society that you exist in. Do you have a whole bunch of planets or are you a coven existing in secret, something in between? And that can really affect what your characters are doing and what kinds of stories you're telling. Are you trying to protect something that is good and positive? Or are you trying to improve it? Are you trying to improve something that's really terrible? Are you just trying to you know, resist oppressive forces? Um, are you exploring and making new connections with new kinds of people. So it is meant to explore a wide range of those kinds of stories, particularly stories that empower people um, who are queer, as well as sort of if you focus on the ways that the mechanics encourage you and facilitate interacting with other people, there are a lot of ways of connecting and trying to understand those other people. So obviously you can try to entice them if you want to approach it in a flirty way, <laughs> um, but you can also try to figure them out and see sort of what makes them tick. And then in keeping with the genre, if you try to figure them out in the middle of a sword fight with them, then you get to ask some extra questions because mm -hmm. some truths of the heart are only revealed when you lock eyes across your flashing blades and see into the other person's oh. soul. So the the fighting uh, is in part uh, it, it, you, it can you can move it to a metaphorical level. You don't have to have swords. You can be playing a tennis match. You can be in a debate with somebody, etc. But it's really meant to bring you those moments of. Um, conflict that are really visceral and really close and really bring feelings to the surface so that they can be explored and so sparks can fly and so on. So you'll see if you look at the options you can pick, if you roll a narrative upbeat on a fight move, some of them are just you taunt or flirt with the person and get some emotional leverage over them. Um, there are no rules for physical injuries. There are conditions. So, mm -hmm. um, 
if you if you receive a condition, you get to pick which one you're you're feeling, um, and it's things like afraid or guilty or hopeless, mm -hmm. and then um, that feeds into a play cycle where if um, if you are are having a condition like that. It's both a role-playing prompt and it carries a little mechanical downside, but then you're also sort of spurred to try to clear that condition. Mm -hmm. And the two major ways of doing that are either someone else in your group gives you emotional support, uh, which is a role that could result in another downbeat as right. you're you're about to kiss, <laughs> but then wrong. your ex breaks in the window and it catches mm. you. At, God, so. I hate when that happens. <laughs> right? <laughs> We've all um, been there. <laughs> um, and then the other way to clear a condition is by taking a destructive action unilaterally. So mm. basically, you know, either... You get that sweet moment of um, emotional support that's intense and requires you to open up, or you have this sort of narrative impetus to go and do something that is, you know, not optimal mm -hmm. um, in in a sort of practical sense, but is very optimal in a drama making storytelling sense, where mm -hmm. you know, because you are insecure, you you rashly challenge uh, the the person that you're jealous of to duel in the middle of this diplomatic function and um yeah. and, and take it from there so mm -hmm. that's where amelia lives in games is like what? okay <laughs> like you know because i don't want to be the person that is like i'm gonna make a stupid decision but like okay you know what in in this situation a normal right. person would be freaked out so i'm gonna be freaked out like you know a normal mm -hmm. person would get upset so i will get upset um, yeah. i love living in that like is this the optimal like you know, mechanical decision? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I'm going to do it because mm -hmm. it's fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I love in particular the way that fate, um, the fate system makes those the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have an aspect and if you lean into the way that it makes trouble for you, you get a mechanical yes. resource, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's actually, it's like giving you that permission. And so there, there are ways that the mechanics of Thirsty Sore Lesbians let you do that same thing um, and give you permission to go for the dramatic beat um, in a way that no one is going to say like, oh no, that's not optimal. We're going to get TPK'd now because you, <laughs> you know, role played your character in a way that's actually fun for the story. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I have a I have a question that's like it's not on our outline, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's my show. Um, <laughs> one of the things that like frustrates me about queer stories a lot of the time is that it's like, oh, look at that struggle and how hard life is, and it's just like what a <laughs> bummer, and it's so terrible. Um, right. And then like this single person overcomes it, and then we all cry, and it's great. Um, what does this game do to kind of I don't want to say like discourage because I don't think most role playing games really like discourage people from telling the stories that they want to tell, but like to encourage other kinds of stories outside of that narrative that we see so often. Yeah. So the tone throughout the game is very much celebratory um, and you are effective people, right? So you can absolutely set up a world where, uh, you know, queer people are oppressed and there are these toxic powers that are enforcing heteronormativity, et cetera. Um, but the, the characters will both have a sort of significant ability to hit narrative upbeats so the mm -hmm. way that the the sort of i'm not sure what the right order is to explain this but the <laughs> characters will have a significant ability to hit narrative upbeats so in their story there are these positive triumphant celebratory moments that are happening and the it's also the case that each character archetype comes with a sort of arc of growth. So it's you're not going to be sort of stagnated or mm -hmm. shut down. I think a, a great one to talk about um, as an example of this is the Seeker playbook. So the, the concept of the Seeker is that they were brought up in this toxic society. They still have a bunch of toxic beliefs, which are the commandments that you define at character creation. But the, the story of that playbook is rejecting those commandments and writing your own convictions. 
And then you can be like an anime protagonist. There's a move to just like shout one of your convictions in the middle of a conflict and get <laughs> you know a mechanical <laughs> benefit from that. Which my favorite recent example was the the character who had rejected oppressive um fashion requirements and her battle cry was it has pockets <laughs> <laughs> oh that's amazing oh, that's so good um so so it really it's both the the tone of the material surrounding the game and the settings are talking about how you can um, be effective and celebrate queer existence even in some of the settings that are very oppressive mm -hmm. um and the the mechanical system is centered not around success and failure, but around the the narrative feeling of the story beat that you get as a result of it. Yeah. So if you roll high, it's a narrative upbeat. Things feel good. You're either making progress or learning something useful or having a good moment of connection. If you roll low, that results in a narrative downbeat, which sometimes that could mean you fail at the thing you're doing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could also just mean you discover a new circumstance that's like bad news <laughs> or over over on you know the next planet the evil galactic empire has reached the next next stage of their propaganda campaign and now you know you see kids in the street playing captain muscle versus the others and beating up aliens because of the <laughs> sort of xenophobic agenda of the empire mm -hmm. um so because the mechanics actively distribute um, those results across the narrative beats, you will get a story that has um, all of those moments, all of those dramatic moments. And you will also be able, typically by the end of the story, to have resources that you can spend to support each other. You actually get them from the start. Um, and so when you really want to pull out a, an upbeat, you are often able to do that, but not always. And that's sort of a design choice because I like being surprised and I yeah. like complications. Definitely. And um, you can absolutely mod it into a token-based game and sort of do it more by, by consensus or preference about what narrative beat you're going to hit next. Mm. But mm -hmm. the game is designed to incorporate the randomness of dice um, so that you get surprised have fun surprises at the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that there's like definitely value for a lot of people in, in sort of playing out difficult situations at the table. Like I, I like to do that. Like there's something kind of therapeutic about that. So like, certainly I wouldn't tell anybody to be like, don't, don't do anything oppressive or terrible ever. If like, if that's what works for you and you want that story of like overcoming that, that's cool. Um, I just know that like, for me, sometimes when I go into games that I know have kind of a queer narrative, I'm like, I already did that in my life. And I don't really want to spend a lot of time like pretending that, you know, I don't exist. So yeah, I absolutely <laughs> wanted, I wanted there to be a queer queer game that was celebratory and had adult protagonists in it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, both both of those, um, I feel, are still underrepresented in mm -hmm. A, media, <laughs> but B, our medium. So yeah. mm -hmm. excited for people to make more of those. Absolutely. Yeah. Our next question on here is supposed to be what is unique about this game, but I feel like we've kind of like just did that a little bit do you have well, other things that you want to yeah. like talk about here <laughs> well i'll just highlight you know my favorite unique mechanic which is the yeah. smitten mechanic mm. okay. so um at any time you may declare that your character is smitten with someone else Ooh. and this has a little mechanical effect, um, but the main thing is you've, you've got to answer a question that's connected to your playbook that is basically going to tell us why that is an interesting or fraught story to tell, right? So if you're the trickster I referred to earlier, then, you know, if you become smitten with someone, you've got to say what's a secret about you that you're sure would make them reject you. Right. Oh. Like, oh, well, now you've, you've got like an oh extra reason to not want to be vulnerable, et cetera. And, and it's, it's a signal to the rest of the table that this relationship is something you're interested in focusing on. Uh, it's a signal to the GM that this particular obstacle is something that's fun and that you want to get poked at. Mm -hmm. And I, 
it's also it can just be really sweet when somebody somebody does something and uh and there's a declaration of smitten right afterwards oh, so that's right. so good Oh, so I'm like, like so excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> so the the big the big muscular warrior leaps in, lifts me up to save me from the the um oncoming dragon breath or whatever. I'm like, okay, smitten. Yeah. Smitten. Yep. <laughs> that does it like, for me. Who wouldn't be? <laughs> right? <laughs> who? <laughs> awesome. I, I, I love that mechanic and I, I can't wait to see some of the examples on the playbooks of of what you might need to reveal uh, uh, at that point. Uh, oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Very juicy. I like it. <laughs> uh, so here's where we talk about the history of the game. Uh, this game hasn't been around too terribly long uh, in the grand scheme of, uh, you know, the role playing industry. Uh, when did you first start working on uh, Thirsty, Thirsty Sword Lesbians? And why? What, oh. like, I want to know, like, what made you be like this is a game that i need to make yeah so the when is an easy answer that's just a a a date a fact so i started working (laughs) on it in late 2017 Mm -hmm. um and i do i have a full-time job sometimes more than a full-time job so there would be spans where i would make no progress on it for months right Mm -hmm. it was just sort of a side thing that was that was uh rattling around in my brain the first play test was january 2018 um so sometimes people are surprised that it predates the the shira reboot Mm -hmm. i think some of the same juices Mm. creative juices were soaking you know in me as in uh noel stevenson but um the the reason was that I really wanted a game like this to exist. I wanted a game that would tell these stories of connection and drama in a way that was celebratory, but also in a way that was really careful and thoughtful about consent. Because, A, if you are telling stories about romance and connection, it's really important that the mechanics support uh, healthy ways of connecting. Mm -hmm. So when I was describing those mechanics before about, you know, you can learn about a person, you can flirt with them. There's no move where like you can roll dice and if it's big, they do what you want, no matter what they want, right? Mm -hmm. That's just not a thing. Um, There's no like, I rolled 20 on a persuasion check. I override this person's like personhood. so I really that. wanted that <laughs> <laughs> for sure, um, and and I I didn't I hadn't experienced it. I have played. I actually went through this fun phase while I was developing Thirsty Sword Lesbians, where any game you put in front of me that supports it, I'm going to play a Thirsty Sword Lesbian. So we were in a play test of um, Agon, the game of Greek heroes. And I'm mm-hmm. like. I'm a thirsty gladius lesbian and and just sort of like to see how it feels. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted a game that really centered that and, and those kinds of connections and those sort of fun, campy, flirty uh, scenes. So Mm -hmm. that, I mean, the the short answer is I wanted it and and I didn't find it in the world yet. So that's why I made a game. Just full of it. It's uh, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah. You're like, I don't want a little of this. Yeah, I don't want one character in this game to be this. I want every character to be this. <laughs> That's so because occasionally, um, you know, someone will, will make a game and I'll be like, oh, you made the me playbook. Like, this is the you made a, yeah. a flirtatious duelist playbook. That's really cool. It's mm-hmm. like, what, what if what if they were all like that? What if they were all, uh, you know, is some form of queer disaster? <laughs> And I also think there are so many different um, ways of experiencing queerness and emotional growth and connection that it doesn't make sense to just have one character type, right? That's supposed to represent all of that. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I put in nine archetypes in the core book. We've got 10 more in the expansion. um, And then fans are making even more. So it really is, um, you know, not a limited well to draw from in terms of the kinds of stories and characters that you're going to celebrate. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the original game... Uh, was originally kickstarted back in 2020, right? Yes. Uh, November. 
Um, yeah. And then just a year later, you had a, another successful Kickstarter with the expansion, Advanced Lovers and Lesbians. Right, right. Yeah, so essentially, the, the, you know, the first Kickstarter was, was wildly successful. We raised almost $300,000. Yeah. And a lot of that went into funding um, the stretch goal contributors. And that was originally envisioned as a PDF, right? We'll have a few more settings, a few more playbooks, and distributed electronically. Mm. And it wound up being more pages than the core book, all oh. told. <laughs> wow. And we're like, well, we've got another book on our hands. So that sort of the second Kickstarter was like a quick two week thing mm. to fund a print run of um, of the stretch goals. And so I'm really excited that I'm going to get to hold those in my hands as well. Because. Mm. Um, it, you know, more than doubles the number of playbooks and then provides all of these settings and adventures that uh, people wrote from uh, Heian era Japan to, uh, um, to a uh, sort of mashup between Gideon the Ninth and she on um, the Ooh. planet Crystallia, right? Like you oh show up, God. you're just a, a death knight. <laughs> You said all the correct words. I'm listening. <laughs> right? I'm a death knight. I'm sworn to protect my necromancer, but we have to infiltrate this party of like these sparkly princesses. So let's uh, you know, let's let's pretend that we're just, you know, we're carefree princesses who love glitter and stuff, and my necromancer's not having it. <laughs> Ryan, so. that's like our characters right now. There's a sparkly <laughs> princess and there's a necromancer. <laughs> That's like everything Ryan and I love. I know. <laughs> I know. That's why that's why I'm super excited to to make characters for this game uh with with you, Amelia. See, because you can this be a is like, princess. This is like exactly our, you know, know. side so of the, the Oh, it's so good. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get into our very exciting Sparkly Princess Necromancers, um basic terms that people might need to know going into this. I know there's the usual um like the like stats um for yeah. the PBTA games, you know, like the plus one and minus one and whatever. Um so do you want to just run through what those are for this game? Yeah, sure. Um and so the the general mechanic, as I mentioned earlier, is you're always just rolling 2d6 and then adding a small number. And usually that small number is one of your stats. So um, daring represents both skill at arms and forcefulness, um, personality and muscle-wise. Grace is elegance, poise, agility. Heart is emotional awareness and expression. Um, wit is cleverness, knowledge, um, quick thinking, and spirit is um, metaphysical power as well as integrity. Hmm. So those are those are the stats, and there are basic moves that rely on all of those. A bunch of the basic moves actually give you options. So when you are fighting, you can do that either in a daring or graceful way. Hmm. Um, when you are emotionally supporting someone, you can do that either with heart or with spirit. Uh, there are others that require a specific stat, but... Um, if you, if you look at the basic moves, they may give you some idea of, um, what you want to focus on. And then each playbook will have moves that use usually two different stats from that range and give you a sense of, um, the, the two primary options for how to build out that playbook. Mm -hmm. And then I saw that strings was a big thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, so strings are, they represent emotional leverage, and they're sort of double-edged in the sense that if I give you a string on me, that might mean, you know, I care about your opinion, or I have a crush on you, or you know how to manipulate me, or have some kind of other leverage. Mm. And at the very start of the game, you're going to give strings to each other. And the fact that that is double-edged and mechanically can be used to either help or hinder uh, or, or you know, push someone towards a course of action means that there's a little bit of an element of vulnerability, uh, which you need to give in order to get the benefits of someone having a string on you that they can use to support mm. you. So um, 
that there is a basic move influence with a string that shows you the, the things that you can do with it. The main things are giving a small adjustment to a dice roll or tempting them. So if they if they follow the course of action that you suggest, uh, you spend the string, they get an XP, and you go from there. So, Ooh. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't um, even have to be something that's bad for them. You could be mm -hmm. like, you are making a scene and you are going to get us uh, tossed in a dungeon. Let me spend my string on you to tempt you to back down from this fight. I know you really want to. You really want to punch that person, but let me let me try to, <laughs> um, you know, mo mm. move you in a different direction. Um, and so you can see consent is built into that because it's a temptation. It's not now I mind control you and you do what I want. Mm -hmm. I like that. And then the other uh, mechanic or term that I will revisit is conditions. We talked about them before, but if you see that word, that is referencing those five difficult emotional states that you might wind up with. Mm -hmm. If you have all five of them checked and you take another condition, you are defeated. Um, that rarely happens unless you're playing one of those self-sacrificing <laughs> playbooks like the devoted who keeps throwing yourself in danger and not doing any self-care and, mm -hmm. um, then maybe you'll learn something from <laughs> from uh, from that experience, but that's the only way I have ever gotten taken out in a one shot. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's amazing! And you're not out like for good, right? You don't lose the character. It's just um, right. for that scene, um, your character is effectively helpless. So it takes a lot to get to that point, and mm -hmm. um, you can give each other emotional support in the heat of battle. You can give each other emotional support if you see someone is flagging and is about to, you know, hit their limit then you can have a, a heartwarming moment. You can seal them for a kiss. You can do what is, uh, is, is needed to help them out. I like that. Is there anything else that we need to go over before we uh, get into making some people? Uh, well, we are going to make the world together first. Oh, yeah. So the first step to that would be um, doing a little safety exercise, which mm -hmm. uh, has a palette. Uh, so the palette is sort of, it includes the, the positive elements of these are things I do want to see mm. in this story or in this setting. Um, and then there are things that you do not want to see either for safety reasons, right? Like you might have a, a hard line against mm. um, something being depicted in the story, or you might just be like, I'm sick of dragons. I'm just bored of dragons. Let's not mm -hmm. do that this game. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the palette exercise. And then there's a little worksheet to go through as a group to make the setting. And that'll make sure that you figure out sort of some of those tone questions that we were talking about at the beginning when we were talking yeah. about the range of tones that the game supports. Mm -hmm. And we'll also define some toxic powers. Like what are the adversarial powerful people or organizations um, that are uh, menacing our characters uh, okay. before then making the characters to inhabit that kind of story. So it's a big exercise in getting on the same page about yeah. the stories we're going to tell. Cool. All right. Well, shall, shall we make a place? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Place. Let's make a place. Let's make a place. Do you have any, uh, any you know, do wants or do not wants for the palette as we get started? Ooh. I heard some affection for necromancers. Okay, so this is our this is our <laughs> aesthetic is that we've Ryan and I have stopped pretending to be anything that we aren't. In the early days of this podcast, we tried to change it up and like make new and different characters every mm -hmm. time. And <laughs> lately, we have decided that the world has enough chaos and we just want to be ourselves and do our thing, in which case Perfect. every single episode Ryan makes a magical girl and I make a necromancer. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, um, something with magical girls and necromancers. You know? That'd be nice, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I yeah. would not be opposed to uh, pirates being included Ooh. as well. Okay. Uh, because uh, the the first thing, when, when you talked about the, the tagline of the game, of uh -huh. uh, Swords Cross and Hearts Race, the very first, like, genre that comes to mind is Pirates. Love uh, it for me. And okay, so you're Peter Pan and I'm Captain Hook. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Love all of this. Um, <laughs> so we're going to have magical girls, pirates, and necromancers. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my. 
Oh my. <laughs> I yeah, I, that that's enough to go from for me. Are there any are there any nopes like um, you know, don't like snakes or uh um, anything that we need to raise at this point? I mean, from a world building standpoint, I'm I'm pretty open to almost everything uh, myself. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing, I mean, like nothing my... that's like you know not normal to you know include on that that sort of list, right? right? Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel yeah. like my nose are just like the you know are the standard like okay, we're decent people, so like you know, yeah. There's nothing non consensual, nothing with children, nothing with you know. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and and my usual caveat of I don't care if there's like slight body horror. Do not describe the sound it makes. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's why. Like, do not tell me what it sounds like. Perfect. Uh, all right. So um, there's this world building worksheet that is in the handouts. It's page four of the handouts that'll make sure we hit all of these um, elements. So what genre is our story? It sounds like a um, like a age of pirates, age of sail, uh, fantasy to me. Does that sound right? I mean. We could go, uh, you know, the Age of Sail. We could go uh, Space Pirate uh-huh. Magical Girl Necromancers. Uh, I mean, I'm, I I'm kind of like futuristic space pirates. I do. I'm not going to lie to you. I think Sweet. I really want space pirates. Do you think space is a vacuum or can you just breathe in space? You just fly around on, on, uh, like, like it's like, it's just like a regular pirate ship, but like, in yeah. space. <laughs> 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 like it's open. Oh um, goodness. But there has to be um, wind. I don't know. I feel like space. I like the idea of like space being dangerous. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Got it. All right. And then like when you're docking with the ships, it's actual like, you know, sci-fi docks and, oh, yeah. and stuff. Like, you gotta yeah, drill like, in and psh, then, like, dash like, across yeah. the the laser plank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, is this? Are we feeling more goofy uh, or um, angsty? What end of the uh, the tone spectrum are we excited about? Oh goodness. <laughs> I mean, I always lean more angsty. Like that's always my yeah. preferred. Perfect. You know, I and feel like we end up in silly a lot of the times. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, I like uh, angsty with like a hint of uh, of goofiness. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. I like the idea of like angsty, but we don't know we're angsty. <laughs> like, <laughs> or the other way around, like it's silly, but we think we're angsty. Oh you know, like, yeah, like, like you're taking like it really teen, seriously. Like teen drama, like you yeah, know. But like yeah. if you're watching it from the outside, you're like, this is stupid. <laughs> like, Incredible. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so, so yeah, let's define the scope of your community. Are you, um, you know, a couple of options? You've got uh, a ship of dependable crew that you know, share your values, and that's your home, or like a whole pirate fleet, or are you pirates from some bigger entity? What are you thinking mm. in terms of the scale of what what your support network is like? Mm. I mean, m- my first instinct would be a single ship. Yeah, that's kind of mine, too, because I was like, otherwise, is there like a union of pirates? But that just sounds like too much bureaucracy for me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't want to be like, I mean, like, we could be like fighting against the pirates union because we're like, you know, we've gone rogue or something. Be Like our (laughs) East India trading company over there. Um, No, I think I think solo. We're we're on our own here. Cool. And what's like especially positive about? that community on the ship are they like really good at emotional support or skill sharing do you have like a really dependable leader um what do you think i think it's a group of people that is just like eminently reliable like they are nice like you're trapped in this like not that big of a ship together. like we just like get along and get each other and like i like that everybody has your back i love that so the next prompt is what NPC epitomizes that virtue? So who is the the big reliable NPC, the one you can always go to, and what do they want? Oh, is it, from is it the like PCs? Uh, the the cook? Of the I was going to say it's a cook or a mechanic. Those <laughs> yeah. are my two. <laughs> it's the cook and the mechanic. Mm-hmm. I think our cook is also our mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well. Um, yeah. Do you want to toss out a name? Oh, names. Hmm. <laughs> What's a good 
space cook name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, the first name that popped in my head was Francesca. Okay. Let's, let's do it. Um, and what does Francesca want from, like, the PCs? Does Francesca, you just want, like, parts and cooking ingredients? Or does Francesca want to be able to be vulnerable and not always be the reliable one with you? What do you think? I think Francesca wants a break. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, especially. Like, I think Francesca likes what she does, but is like, I would like to be able to not do that too. Yeah. Right. I mean, she she fixes the ship. I say as a single mom. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She fixes the ship and fixes hearts and uh, feeds us. And uh, she just needs some. some And is like very happy to do all of that, but would like somebody to like maybe reciprocate. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, Oh, Francesca. I know. I feel for you. <laughs> it's not at so, all a uh, personal. Right. <laughs> I'm setting the sorry. timer until someone is smitten with Francesca. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is a serious flaw of your community? So these are things like they might be combative or engage in endless deliberation or just like be really stretch thin on resources or um, depend on a problematic activity. That is one that I've seen picked by pirates a few times. Um, Mm. If you think piracy is problematic Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, so what's, what's a flaw we've defined, you know, there's this great reliability and mutual support. And what's, uh, what's the downside? I think they are like fiercely insular. So like Mm. we are, tighten it but like nobody you're not going to let anybody new in we're not going to like go and integrate ourselves in any other kind of group like Mm -hmm. like it's our it's our little click Mm. do you think there's like effectively a hazing period if if you recruit somebody new i mean probably yeah yeah yeah. but like we we want to say that there's not but there like definitely is we're just like no we just want to like get to know what you're good at and we want to you know (laughs) um like we pretend it's not that Mm -hmm. okay so now we get to make an npc who epitomizes the flaw and figure out what they want so who's the one who uh who, who either is really driving this insularity or is the one who uh is putting the newbies through their paces uh Good question. I think it's somebody who, like, we were going to get an assistant for Francesca. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, we're like, okay, you know, we got to do this. But then we're like, nobody's good enough because we really like Francesca. (laughs) And so, like, we have this person and we're like, we got to, like, you know, we're giving them a really, really hard time. And it is hazing, but also we're like, no, we need to make sure that you're good enough. We're We're just picky. We're just picky because Francesca is really important to us. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so they, they're actually like on the receiving end of that flaw of the community. Right. Mm. So what they want from the PCs is probably um, connection. Now, if we were doing a campaign at this point, I'd probably make up a, another NPC who is sort of enforcing that norm. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, No one's good enough for Francesca. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's because that person is secretly in love with Francesca. Yeah, doesn't want <laughs> you figured it out. Oh, no. You figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, amazing. Yeah, you know, we're supposed to define a location, but I think the ship is a great location. Yeah, um, and we also define why it would be a d- dramatic place to have a sword fight. Um, so this is a great moment to get a mental image of what is what does the ship look like? You know, if we're in space. Is there an equivalent to like rigging or swinging across through space? Do you like shoot yourself out of little tubes to board other ships? What's the, what does it look like? What does it look like when you're having a sword fight? I mean, I I feel like the ideal place for a sword fight is like a cargo area, like a huge, like, so there's like all kinds of boxes and things Mm. like that. But there's also like maybe like catwalks across and obviously Star Wars style, no railings. No, Uh, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) But like conveyor belts and. Right, right. And occasionally no gravity. uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. I, I, I can imagine like the the big the big bay doors open up and there's like you know the the Star Wars style force field where things can go through but not air. Right, um, right. And 
So it keeps the atmosphere in, but then you like uh, kind of extend that out as like a game plank when you're boarding other ships. Oh, nice. Mm. And then nice. You, you you can like effectively either drill into the ship itself or go to one of their uh, exterior uh, doors and and extend that protection so you can just go right into their ship. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, launch the laser harpoon and then just you know slide down that line through the yeah. extended um the extended atmosphere bubble yeah, that sounds cool. amazing yeah <laughs> great love Perfect. it so we've got your ship it needs a name oh i'm so bad at names <laughs> <laughs> i didn't bring my book in here with me um, well we haven't touched on the necromancy aspect at all yet do you think there's like a an element to the ship that incorporates Mm. that is it haunted is it um like made of bones what's the um if you want to draw that element in that's a possible source of inspiration i Mm. feel like it has to be like like powered by necromantic magic right that's what i was thinking right oh interesting ship's haunted it's it's powered ship's by haunted. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fueled by souls <laughs> yeah it's fueled by souls but like in a okay. non-destructive way like it's like like somebody figured out oh. perpetual motion with souls mm. effectively yeah and that's right but somebody has to be there to like keep it going yeah you know? to shape like, it and, and to... make sure the souls are are contained yeah and... make sure that they stay inside the oh. tank you know yeah. yeah, that would be an amazing NPC Because nobody too, wants a right? soul spill. Like, <laughs> no, no, you no, don't no, want no, you're not spill. eating the souls. That's, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the villains might do that. Right, but, yeah, right. you know, on your ship, it's, you know, maybe an old friend. Maybe you knew them when they were alive. I mean, for us, it's about a sustainable fuel source. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, I would absolutely make the, the ship a character at this point, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So if the the core of it is souls, maybe it's even this amalgam personality that has all the memories of all of these souls and is a mm. is a collective entity <sighs> that can yeah. So it has like I think it has like ship. all kinds of like weird quirks like that the because AI of, of the that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and yeah. all, all of our uh, fallen comrades that have uh, you know signed up for becoming part of the ship when they pass. Right, right? you can be an organ we, donor and you yeah, can be a they, soul they, donor. They basically <laughs> donate their soul to the ship yeah. and they live oh on within the systems. So right. like if so, you had a connection with somebody in, in life and one of them dies, you still have uh, an avenue to connect with them through the wow. ship AI. Mm-hmm. So this is telling me that Francesca is cook, mechanic, necromancer, right? Like, how do you maintain this <laughs> ship if you don't have, uh, you know, some some necromancy? Her wrench is a magic wand at this point. <laughs> Love it. Oh. Uh, all right. We didn't name the ship, though. You almost got away almost with got it. There. You distracted oh, me with some really good details. <laughs> Curses. Um, what's a good, like, spooky death name? The Soul Train? Soul Train? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I, I couldn't help but throw that one out there. I think we could call it Solar Flare, except it's like soul. Oh my like. God. I'm there. I, I, am, I am all about the pun based. I do like uh, it. Yeah. I think, I think it's called Solar Flare. Mm-hmm. Solar Flare. Love it. Um, all right. So now, you know, for a campaign, we would define two toxic powers here. Let's just do one um, and let's make it an external threat. So you can have toxic powers that are either um, threatening your community from outside or from within. Uh, Let's do one. There's something external that is threatening that um, for our purposes, let's say they have a specific beef with you. So they Mm. actually... Um, you know, are are an active threat. They're not just out there being bad. They are, um, you know, clearly going to cause you some trouble. So, what do we think? Rival, they are? rival pirate crew. Rival pirate crew. Yeah, what like do they we, want? We, we keep on uh, going for the same scores, Ooh. and uh, and it, and we're better. It, yeah, and we're we're better in some cases. Like they they still win sometimes. Like that's, but yeah. that, but like we are more consistent with winning uh, the score. Okay. 
And are these do these pirates do the evil like consume souls to power their uh, oh they got show? it they got it yeah for sure yeah for sure. what do they want from you do they want to humiliate you or like take your the possessions that that you've gotten from do they want your souls I, I, like I what's the deal want, do they want our sustainable soul technology right oh. <laughs> or or just how uh, they want us out of the picture. Because if we weren't in the picture, I mean, they would get They'd all of be these winning, scores. Yeah. All right, all right. They want you gone. What makes them so dangerous? Do they have like blackmail on you? Are they just ruthless? Are there lots of them, or is there like a particular divine power or special magic? What's their What's their advantage they, here? They are incredibly attractive. Oh. <laughs> We yeah. keep accidentally falling in love with them. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. They're just like like disgustingly charming. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You are ahead of the game because the next question is what's appealing about them? <laughs> Everything. 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 They're just so hot. Aside so from the suave. part where they're trying to kill us, super right? into it. Uh-huh. <laughs> They'll be in the middle of trying to kill you and you'll just swoon a little bit. Like, yeah. oh, no, no, got to get my guard up. God, but yeah. they look so good while they're doing it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um, yep. So we define a location. As they, so it's probably their ship. It's their mm-hmm. it's their soul eating ship. Let's just call it the soul eater. The soul Done. eater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the soul eater. Uh, there you go. Yeah, and now we get to make an NPC who is the face of that toxic power. So oh. who is let's say the captain of the soul eater? Who is this this hot sword lesbian space pirate? Oh goodness! I feel like I want her to call herself Joan of Arc. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> That or something really fancy, like some kind of like really fancy, like flourishy kind of name. Mm. Evangeline. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Evangeline, I captain like of the Soul Eater. Oh, it's so good. It's so sexy. <laughs> Here to take your souls. <laughs> All right. You so take whatever you want. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, all right. Love it. We did it. We've done world building. Oh, so we, we know, you know, we've got the, the crew of the solar flare. We've got the soul eater. Uh, Francesca solar flare is, you know, a conscious gay spaceship, which, you know, I love. And, <laughs> um, and then Evangeline over there just being way too hot. It's unfair. And, and coming to take, all that you have to offer. <laughs> now we get to make the PCs. Mm. All right. Yeah. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. You ready for this? I'm so ready. So so what is the first step that we need to do uh, for character creation? So each character is based primarily around a particular archetype that's embodied in a playbook. So these are things like the trickster that we talked about before or the seeker, um, as well as the ones that are in the uh, advanced lovers and lesbians expansion, like the investigator or the naga. Mm. So the first step would be to look through the list of playbooks and figure out which ones appeal to you. And particularly, each one has a little intro paragraph that'll tell you what they're all about and what their core emotional conflict is going to center around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that conflict was the part that, like, gave me the best idea of what what I was going for. Just like one little sentence is super helpful. Packed a lot in there. (laughs) Well, I don't know how you want to do this. There are 19 official ones at this point, so we probably don't want to go through all of them. But maybe if you're each considering a few different ones, we could Mm -hmm. we could talk about what differentiates them. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, there's one called Spooky Witch. Oh yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) that is definitely on the table for me. Um, It says their central conflict lies in navigating the pressures to conform versus their own desire or those of their monstrous friends, which sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the spooky witch, they can see the unseen. um, And that's sort of like a generic term that you get to flesh out. Are the unseen these souls? Are they Mm -hmm. um, interdimensional 
aliens that only you can see, um, but they are also, you know, a metaphor for people who go unseen by others. So that's your that's your conflict, right? You can see them, you befriend them, you care about them, and they also might need you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the trickster was interesting too. Um, the central conflict lies in desiring closeness while fearing vulnerability. We've talked about that one a little bit in a couple of your examples too. Yeah, people will also often tell me that they feel called out by that one. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my process of picking one uh, was entirely uh, the thought of which one of these is the most magical girl. Uh, yeah, for like, sure. Uh, and uh, from the advanced lovers and lesbians uh, playbooks, the Legion kind of oh, stuck Oh, absolutely. Out. Oh, goodness. Uh, this, the Legion is a soldier chosen by destiny and the latest to bear the name and powers of their mm -hmm. legacy of past incarnations. Their central conflict is figuring out who they are between their present self and the many thems that came before them. Uh, yep. that, yeah. that sounds amazing. Yeah, I definitely oh, earmarked that one as one that you would enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, really fun. Yeah, I recently played a Legion and just telling that tragedy, right, where um, you know, you lose pieces of your current memory that are really important in the course of getting the power of these past lives. And so you're navigating that legacy versus, um, mm -hmm. you know, your current identity. It's very magical, girl. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, yeah, I felt like that or the devoted Ryan would be. <laughs> yeah, devoted was definitely another one that I was thinking of. Um, That's like pretty classic Ryan. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think devoted. the Legion is a little more interesting for you, and especially yep. for like this story. But the devoted is, you know, yeah. that's uh, your <laughs> and and the matriarch was a nice uh, kind of middle ground as well. Mm. Um, yeah, which, uh, the super mom uh, kisser of many. Uh, yeah, I looked at that one, and then I was like, this is a little too real, and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> yeah, but I love the example archetypes for the Legion, uh, the first one being pretty guardian of destiny. And, and if, that <laughs> isn't, if, if that doesn't scream Sailor Moon, yep. um, I don't know what does. Yeah, Pam Ponzellan did a great job with that, and there's actually a setting that is designed to hook into the Legion specifically as well. Mm. Um, in advanced lovers and lesbians so that's that's a great one that's a great pick as between um that and the devoted um the legion is probably a little more spotlighty um so the devoted you know can has a whole bunch of like support moves um but can also sort of do some shared spotlight moments when they're rescuing someone or what have you. There's a sort of intentional design in the playbooks that you can pick both what level of um, like conflict you want. The Matriarch is a pretty low angst playbook. You can play any of them angsty, but it doesn't sort of intrinsically come mm. with a big heavy angst. The way that the Seeker, obviously, like you're rejecting everything you've been taught. There are all these people trying to enforce it. That's sort of an intrinsically high... Mm you know, conflict playbook. So the matriarch can be more mellow. The nature witch can be more mellow. Um, the spooky witch even can be more mellow, right? Like mm -hmm. if if you're just, you know, I don't have any conflict about this. I love the unseen and people who think they're bad are wrong. Done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, you know, now my conflict is just the world is crummy and I'm trying to fight for what I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, or you could play it in a way that has more sort of internal angst, but. Mm -hmm. uh, those, all, those are all great picks and fit really well with this setting and everything that we've been developing. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on what you would like to do? Because you get to make one, too. Mm -hmm. I get to make one? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. I didn't think about that at all. I thought I was Join just uh, facilitating this thing. <laughs> no. All right. So we've got a, a magical legion, girl. We've got... Um, I think I'm going to go with the spooky witch. Spooky witch. Because I think that that... <laughs> I yeah. cannot, it, it, you know, it's called seriously. the spooky witch. <laughs> like, yeah. As yeah. I have, like, above my computer here, I have a wreath that I bought that has, like, beautiful flowers, and some of them are black roses, <laughs> and then little glittery gold spiders in it. Like, that's oh my, my that's my decor. <laughs> right now. That's so good. Um, I, I'm going to go with um, the spaceship. So I'm going to play the spaceship, the, the Mass of Souls. And I'm going to do that with the bloody playbook. So the oh. bloody, yeah, the Ooh. bloody is a character who 
has seen a lot of things and um, been through a lot of trauma um, and is has sort of the protective element and a fierce element and is is trying to essentially, you know, find a place in between the extremes of someone who is who doesn't fit in with the place that they like care about anymore um, versus, uh, you know, feeling like they can't lower their guard and so on. So that is what comes to mind. I think the dream mirror would be a really fun other direction to take it. That's another expansion playbook mm -hmm. where you don't really know what you want. You are like reflecting the desires that other people have. You're trying to be the perfect person for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then over the course of the playbook, figuring out more about what you really want and how to stick up for that. Um, and I think either of those could work really well for, you know, a living yeah. spaceship, right? Someone who is a home for others. Um, I think while I also having their own needs. I think Hollow Goddess would be interesting too, uh, mm, in, in yeah. that sort of thing where you could embody the person, one of the personalities at a time, and you're just constantly oh. switching between souls or whatever. Uh, I love that. Interesting. And especially there are elements of the Hollow Goddess that are all about having like a fragmented memory and having lost connections. Mm -hmm. Um and that works really well for a mass of ghosts that mm -hmm. might not might not be able to remember anything from all those lives. So yeah, ah, uh, so many good ways to take it. I think I think uh, I think I'll go ahead and start with the Hollow Goddess. So one of the fun things about TSL is over the course of play, you will probably take a character through um, two or three playbooks before you're done telling their story. Oh, so. Cool. I might start as, say, the dream mirror. Like, I don't really know what I want. I'm just sort of reflecting everybody else. I just, like, woke up as souls in this necromatrix. And, um, you know, am I even allowed to want things? Or am I just a tool and a home for all these people? And then, you know, when you get over that, you might be like, cool. Well, now I'm the hollow goddess. Now I sort of know that I've lost some memories and I care about that, but I also have enough um, of myself to um, to sort of work on that grief and prioritize myself a little bit. And then maybe you're the grizzled veteran bloody later on. And then, you know, mm -hmm. by the time you're done with that, you're like, cool, I, I'm ready for this character to live happily ever after. So let's land in the middle. I'll go for the hollow goddess. Um, Catherine Cross did a great job with that um, playbook. and. It it fits. Uh, it totally fits the the ghost mass that I am. I already have a name. I'm ahead of the game. I'm oh. uh, I'm the Solar Flare now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now now question. Uh, flare spelled uh, F L A R E or F L A I R. <laughs> Ooh. Let's go double pun. Yeah. yeah. Double pun. F L A I R. <laughs> Always stick more puns in there. <laughs> you, you might as well. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Call to watch action. Yeah, like that. Ryan, this game is really good. It's this so is like good. a really good game. <laughs> like, so like we've covered a lot of PBTA games. Yeah. And you know, like we're just getting into this. So it, you know, we haven't haven't really started to like dig deep into it, but like, oh, oh, there's just like so I much know. here in like the content and the tone of it, even mm -hmm. that I I'm like so hyped about and i can't wait for people to hear yes what we do to this <laughs> well, it, it's interesting it's interesting because like you know i think we're both suckers for romantic content yeah, we totally in, are in games and, yeah, and, and like think, just the messiness of it i don't even think that like yeah. i'm sort of like the like the kissing and the you know but like just like the drama of a mm -hmm, good romance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that like let's make it messy <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that's uh, why the uh, Christmas belonging also helped resonate yeah. with us. A, a Christmas, but also it, like right. romance tropes up the wazoo uh, right. in in those Christmas type stories. So like, yeah, it's 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 so good. And goodness, next episode it just gets even better. And I just have to say, the joy of something that like celebrates queerness in this way is really exciting for mm -hmm. me. Something that I don't have to like find a way to make it queer 
Um, yeah. Because that's not like, you know, and I'm just same for you. Like, that is not the version of gaming that I come from. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, okay, like this character happens to be like, but this is like yep. a celebration of that in a way that I haven't gotten to play out really before. Yeah, so absolutely. It's very I, exciting. I, I, I loved seeing that. And I loved that it wasn't like, you know, created in such a way that's, uh, you know, it, it could have been something gross. If, some, been if, if the wrong yeah. creator made this, yeah. it would have been bad. But this is fantastic. But this was it's not. Made, <laughs> it's made from a place of love and it yeah. shows. From love and like an understanding of, you know, like what she wanted from this game. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, before we go, let you go for the week so that you can hurry through this week and get to next week and find out what else happens in our <laughs> Thirsty Sword Lesbian series, <laughs> uh, just a few calls to action. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, if you enjoyed what you heard today and you're interested in seeing more, check out the Truths of Heart bundle on Itch, uh, which has six new playbooks and three new settings. You can find the link for that in our show notes. I was recently on an episode of kill every monster i joined aram and dylan to talk about my favorite thing the undead and necromancy Mm -hmm. and the moral and economic implications of raising the dead and how to get sustainable skeletons (laughs) i cannot recommend it enough i had such a great time recording it aram did a phenomenal job with the editing um i am a little bit bummed because i know that he had to cut a ton of stuff out and it was still like an hour and a half um but it was it was a fantastic time and i hope that you will take a listen um and that you will enjoy listening to it as much as i enjoyed making it uh you can find that episode at killeverymonster.com or on any podcatcher Mm -hmm. uh we would love to get some more reviews uh from you uh, if you can leave a review on Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, Spotify, etc. Uh, every five-star review we get on one of those services, we'll read it right here on the show. Uh, if you have a few minutes, we would absolutely love to hear from you. It is Girl Scout cookie season. If you have a Girl Scout in your life, please find them and order some cookies from them. It is the best way to support them. It go The funds from cookies go to support activities that they do year round um if you don't know a girl scout and you just really want some thin mints i know a guy um i will put (laughs) eleanor's link in the show notes so if you are looking for somewhere to buy cookies you can buy them from her perhaps absolutely and for now uh while we are all stuck dreaming about cookies until those orders come in uh Thanks for joining us, everybody. Until next week, stay safe, drink some water, get vaccinated, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. 
So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit One Shot Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep going. <laughs> if you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Backstory. Backstory is a cozy, thoughtful interview show featuring the most fascinating folks in role-playing. Join host Alex Roberts as she gets to know game designers, LARP rights, scholars, community organizers, and more. From emerging artists to seasoned veterans, guests open up about their creative process, what keeps them engaged, and their visions for the future of role-playing.